Hey guys, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and we are live. <laughs> and you might notice that I've got a special guest, Donnie Cates. Everybody's uh, comments worked. <laughs> so, okay, I, I barely even know where to start, sir. Um, <laughs> let's see. You have, you kind of came onto the scene like a freaking rocket ship and just blown everybody away, man. The first time I heard of you was in Baby Teeth over in Aftershock Comics. Yeah. Um, that is amazing. Uh, what's up, Sue Ann? Hey, shh. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you call it? Yeah, that, that absolutely blew me away. I'm following it since. I think there's only two of us on YouTube who are reviewing it, and I'm way cooler than that guy. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, dude, yeah, how much can you tell us about what's going on right there? Right now, Heather is in hell. She's about mm -hmm. to start uh, fighting off the demons of hell, literally. And we mm -hmm. saw what just happened to the one Palestinian woman and her son uh, when they were in hell. What what can we expect there? I mean, nothing good, man. Um, uh, yeah, things are going to start getting really brutal in that book. You know, uh, One of the things that I've always really liked about Baby Teeth is that um, you know, Sadie is a protagonist, unlike a lot of other ones. Um, she's not uh, a character that's really going to be saving the world through um, machine guns and punching and all those kinds of things. In fact, in issue, what is it, 11, uh, we open on just establishing just how absolutely terrible she is at being an action hero. Um, so what I like about her is that she's going to be, um, you know... Uh, if she succeeds in saving the world, it'll be through being a good mom. Um, but we have a lot of heartache coming, you know, as we saw at the end of uh, issue 11, I think, um, you know, Clark's a little grown up now. He's at least toddling about, you know, and, you know, uh, if she ever finds him again, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be a hard day for her. Um, you know, that's, that's the kind of the cornerstone of that book is that, um, yes, there's like a, a bunch of like really like crazy hell stuff and, you know, demons and, and the red realm is crazy and all that. But the stuff that stands out for me that the moments that I chase in that book are the small emotional beats. Right. Um, and you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, it's a story about a mother and a child kind of facing, uh, facing a big scary world and trying to deal with that just so happens that that baby happens to be the antichrist. Um, uh, and, uh, and yeah, I don't know how much I can give away. Um, uh, obviously Marty's as big as a goddamn lion now. Um, and so that's going to be cool. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, if, if, if there's a person on earth who is equipped to, um, to raise Clark, um, through the depths of hell, it is Heather. Uh, Absolutely. Heather's the baddest dude alive. Uh, <laughs> And so uh, we'll be seeing how much that's going to kind of change her. And um, uh, you know, that, it, it reminds me actually. That there, there's a line I think in maybe the second or the third issue of Baby Teeth that says that um, if Heather was born in any other uh, era and time, that she would have been a great warrior or or a or a leader. Um, and I think that what we're going to see with Heather in the Red Realm is the culmination of that. Right. Is that like we're seeing her in maybe a more natural setting for her than like trying to fit in with like the rest of society. Right. Um, so while it's going to be hard on every, everyone else, you might just learn that Heather kind of maybe prefers it there. Um, now, whether or not everyone else can kind of adapt to that environment uh, will yet to be seen. So uh, it's a very long way of answering your very simple Thing you ask me. <laughs> no, not at all, man. The more the better. I, I love Heather as a character. Um, I love how useless Sadie is, pretty much, and her her father had to be the one to point it out to her. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so a Tomahawk, issue zero. Did you do more mm -hmm. than just zero? Mm -hmm. The only one oh, I was yeah. able to find was zero, sorry. But that was amazing. I never read that in Heavy Metal Magazine. Yeah. Well, there's actually not well, there, there, there is more of it, and there's not, right? Like, there's the issue zero is a is a is a collection rather of um, all the short stories we did in the magazine, and then um, the story has continued in the back of Image Plus magazine, mm -hmm. um, and it's we've been doing the origin of the Cyberzerker himself. We actually 
have some big news coming about a tomahawk. Um, I don't know when, when we're going to announce it, uh, but it's coming up soon. Uh, tomahawk is coming back. Ian's coming back. I'm coming back. Um, and we have some uh, pretty rowdy news to announce uh, about a tomahawk very soon. Sick. So I guess everybody should start following you on Twitter so that they can uh, keep up with that news. A Absolutely. tomahawk is badass, dude. Like I'm shocked at just how down, dirty, gritty, amazing that is. Thank you, dude. Yeah, it's um, it's a trip. Um, I'm not really, um, I'm not really in control of a tomahawk in the way that I am with all my other books. You know, I mm. all my other books kind of starts out with like an idea that I have, and then I, you know, I script it out, and I, you know, collaborate with my artists and stuff. On a tomahawk, I'm working with my buddy Ian, uh, who does all my tattoos. Uh, he does all my work on my sleeve and everything. And uh, I've known Ian forever here in Austin. He's one of my best dudes. He's one of my best friends. And really, he was he was working on my on my arm uh, one day in the shop. And whenever he works on my arm, he's always talking about like cool ideas he has for um, for like fun stories and stuff. And he has all these characters and that he would sketch. And one day he just said the word a tomahawk, and I was like, "Yo, turn off your gun! What what the fuck did you just say? What was that word that you just said out loud?" And and so we just started working on it together, and just like trying to figure out like what that could be. And really, I mean, the God's honest truth of like what happens on that book is that I go, I <laughs> um, I go on to, uh, or I go over to his house. And we like work out the the beats, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I go back to my place, and he starts painting. But then by the time I come and pick up all the pages, he's just deviated and just done whatever the hell he wants. <laughs> and so then I have about two days, three days to figure out how to put words over it and make it make sense. And so it's really just me like chasing Ian around. And Ian doing whatever the hell he wants, and then I go over there and just add like super metal like lyrics over it, right? And it, you know, it it works well enough, I think. <laughs> so he's the Kirby to your Stan Lee. It, 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 yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's great. All right, uh, we talked a little bit before this. Uh, Redneck and God Country. I never read them. Make me want to. No. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever the hell you want <laughs> um, no, um, you know God Country and Redneck are probably my two um, like the most personal things that I write you know um, and they are uh, it's more light in here there we go um, it's um, you know God Country is about an is about an old man named Emmett who um, he uh, he has Alzheimer's and he, uh, it's kind of tearing his family apart, and uh, uh, it, it's it's kind of turning him into like kind of a bad dude. And he's, you know, his son is trying his his damnedest to 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 maintain the family and keep the family together, um, but it's really hard, you know, that kind of thing can like really tear a family apart. And then, um, and then in the middle of that, um a giant tornado comes and just rips the entire town apart and the wreckage of that tornado and it, it destroys Emmett's house and it destroys everyone's, you know, land and everything. Um, in the wreckage of that, Emmett finds a 12 foot tall, uh, talking enchanted indestructible sword named Valifax. And when he's holding onto that sword, his Alzheimer's is cured and he knows who he is. He knows who his family is. And he, um, is kind of returned to the sweet, loving father that he always was. Um, but the problem is, is that that sword uh, doesn't belong to him. It belongs to a bunch of 20-foot-tall Kirby gods, and they would very much like their sword back. And uh, Emmett, being a good old Texan boy, very much tells them to come and get it. Um, and uh, it, it, it does not go well for really anyone involved. Um, and it's uh, just six issues. It's collected into one trade. Um, and that sword, Valifax, is uh, this guy right here. It's that big ass sword on my arm there. Um, so that's like probably the, the thing that I was the most um, well known for before the Marvel stuff. And then, um, and then Redneck is um, the the ongoing image book I do. That is, um, it is uh, about a small family of vampires. 
in East Texas that are just trying to kind of get by. Um, wait, hold on. Megan Hutchison on on our chat asked to see my anime hair. Yes, yes. I have crazy <laughs> I have crazy anime hair right now because it was dyed hot pink and now it's faded into this weird bubblegummy thing. Um, <laughs> And so, hi, Megan. Megan's a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> um, and anyway, they're 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 trying their best to um, to like get to get by and to like survive. Um, and they, and to that end, they have um, uh, they run a barbecue joint and they live off the cattle because they have a little cattle ranch and they live off the blood of the cattle and they sell the meat at the barbecue place. And they've been able to survive for a long time, but then, you know, something in the first issue happens that kind of uh, threatens that peace uh, they've had with, like, the townsfolk. Um, and I won't spoil too much about it, but again, it's, you know, uh, with all my books that kind of take place in Texas, it's, uh, it's really personal and about my family and that kind of stuff. So, you know, God Country is huge and bombastic, but very emotional, as is Redneck. Um, but they're a little bit different than like, you know, most of my Marvel work, which is just me playing with action figures and like smashing toys, Other you know, people's stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's see. Uh, let's get, let's kill off some comments before, uh, yeah, sure. If anybody has any questions or anything on the live stream, like. Hit me up, man. I'm just eating lunch, so if anybody has anything they want to know, uh, I'll answer anything to the best of my ability, you know? All right, so uh, Donnie is FF1 through 3 after Death of Inhumans. What? Fanta is Fantastic Four 1 through 3 after Death of the Inhumans? That's a good question. Okay. Uh, let's see. Sean <laughs> is my Eye of Agamotto. He sees things that I don't see. So, uh, let's see. I will, I will say this before we go on, I'm happy to answer anything about my books. Um, you know, if I, I'm not going to spoil anything, but I can't answer anything about anybody else's books. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite in human book and why did you come up with the idea to kill them? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I mean my favorite in human book, um, I, I, I have two actually, um, uh, Paul Jenkins' Marvel Knights run with Jay Lee. Um, obviously, I don't know if people have heard, uh, I'm a big fan of the Marvel Knights. Uh, I'm relaunching that entire line uh, this year. Yes. So, um, you know, and Paul Jenkins, one of my favorite writers, um, and that series is wonderful. Um, and then my other favorite Inhumans thing is a book called uh, Silent War, um, which is just a phenomenal little story that kind of got swept over because um, it came out around, I want to say like 2007, 2008. And so it was like kind of um, eclipsed by Civil War and like Planet Hulk and World War Hulk and stuff like that. But it was this quiet little story dealing with, um, you remember when Quicksilver stole all the Terrigen Mists and all that? I know um, the story. I actually read it on vacation this time last year. I reread it on vacation. Silent War? Yeah, I was actually planning. I do uh, spotlights on stories. I was just talking to Sean Isaacs um, mm -hmm. recently, and uh, he he turned me on to this thing that he drew called uh, uh, Stray, who killed the Doberman. And I'd never heard of it before, so I read it, and then I just put out a spotlight on story of it today. Or I just talk about the story and try and get people to buy it. But uh, every every Saturday, I put something like that out on. So uh, I actually read that last year, uh, Silent War, and I was because I was planning on making a story for it. I just never got around to it. It's cool, right? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And and it's funny because um, uh, I'm having a brain fart right now. I can't remember who's writing uh, Quicksilver. Oh no, um, I know his name. Saladin. Yeah, Saladin. Saladin Ahmed. Duh. Um, yeah, he's writing, and he's making me love Quicksilver again after reading that series, where everybody yeah. had to kill him, including me. <laughs> totally. Um, as to why I'm trying to kill them all, um, you know, uh, sometimes you got to kill stuff. I don't know. <laughs> if you got a story to tell and, and you get approved, I'm down with it. That's the thing, man. And let me just say, let me just, let me just say that, you know, um, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who, when that book got announced, even as it's coming out, 
uh, say things like, um, like that Marvel told me to do this or that like Marvel somehow it has some sort of a plan that like, Oh, now we got the X-Men back. We're going to kill these guys off and everything. Let me just quickly say, that's not how anything works over there. Um, people seem to think that, um, if you want to blame anybody for those kind of things, <clears throat> you know, there's like 12 or 13 of us who were exclusive writers and really were the problem. Uh, cause we have these Marvel retreats where the 13 of us who are exclusive get into a room and we kind of plan everything and we kind of like put all the pieces together and kind of things move around what happens in that room. Um, and it really is dictated by the writers. And so with Inhumans, um, I had a story I wanted to tell, and this is that story. Like no one is m making me do anything. Um, uh, you guys don't know me, uh, but anyone who's ever met me, uh, who would, it, it, you'd be hard pressed to, to meet anyone who would say that I'm someone who can be made to do anything. Um, so, uh, uh, rest assured, um, if you want to be mad at anybody about Lockjaw being dead, this guy. Oh man, where's my Lockjaw figure? I got a plush Lockjaw right here somewhere. I wanted to show him to, and you, you seem to have an issue with, uh, killing dogs, man. What's going on? You, I know. You made the most popular Sorry about character that. in well, the look, Marvel man. universe. <laughs> I've only killed two dogs and I brought one back as a ghost. So really... <laughs> Technically speaking, I've only killed one dog. I mean, they're both dead, but <laughs> one I brought back, and so just, you know, yeah, sometimes I, you got to kill a dog. I don't know. Dude, I played Dungeons and Dragons. Ghosts are, are dead. <laughs> I can assure you that. <laughs> That's true. True. <laughs> uh, so, dude, what's uh, did could you have possibly known that Bats was going to be as popular as he was? Oh, my God, no. Uh, I... I I love bats, um, and I wanted to. I thought it'd be a fun character, you know, because I found um, when I picked up Strange, kind of the plot line that I had outlined for Stephen was going to be kind of a, for lack of a better term, like a midlife crisis for him. Mm -hmm. um, I was kind of going through some stuff in my own life that I kind of just like filtered into it, um, but I needed him to have a companion while also having him having lost everything, and I loved the idea of him being a veterinarian. Um, and I had just lost my cat. My cat Autumn had just died, and so I I wanted to talk about that. I don't know, you know. Um, and so I, uh, so I, I, I invented this this little this little this little dude named Bats um, <laughs> that I really like. Um, but then everyone else really liked him, and I was so scared when people started enjoying him. And I knew what I had to do to him. Uh, I was like, oh, no. Like, you guys aren't supposed to like him this much. Like, please don't get attached. Um, but I always knew I was going to be bringing him back, right? I always knew that that was the plan, that, like, he was going to um, be a permanent part of Steven going forward, but as a ghost. And so when Bats died, when Loki, you know, led to his death... Oh my God, Twitter exploded on me and I had to, I couldn't say anything about it, but I was just like, guys, just, just like, just hang on, just hang on. He's coming back. I promise. Um, and it's one of those things, man, like you write in a bubble, right? Like you're writing on Dr. Strange or you're writing on Thanos, or you're writing on Venom or any of these things and you kind of just get it in your head that you're just writing on your title and you, well, it's, it's, it's easy to forget that you're the the books that you touch are attached to everything else. So it is really cool. I started to read, um, you know, Mark Wade took over for me, uh, from Dr. Strange mm -hmm. and I started reading Dr. Strange or I started reading Mark Wade's scripts as they came in and Bass showed up and I was like, Holy shit, Bass is going to, he's, he's still going to be there. Like he's just going to keep hanging out. That's insane. Um, and like a bunch of other writers have used him. And like, so like every time, uh, I get messages all the time from the other writers at Marvel if they kind of a beat where someone needs to go to the Sanctum and they put Bats in. And it's always just so nice that, like, he's become, like, this weird, like, permanent figure in the Sanctum. It's, I don't know, it's rad. So I assume you're going to get some kind of royalties when they make a Bats movie? <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's hope they at least, honestly, like, this is real talk. This is not me being silly. I really hope they put him in the next Doctor Strange movie. I, you know, I don't, I don't think anyone would want that more than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
if anybody's not aware, you wrote from issues uh, 381 to 390 uh, right. of Doctor Strange. That's where Bats the Dog was introduced. Um, that was an interesting one because you uh, Marvel went from Doctor Strange Volume 4 back to Volume 1 with you. And then Mark Way took over for Volume 5. <laughs> so the, the strange Marvel numbering, I know. I don't claim to understand any of it either. <laughs> oh, no, I understand it. It's just hard for me to always explain it to people when they ask. So issue sure. number 390, I'm wondering, is uh, that the retreat that you went on where you had a conversation with uh, Chip Zardosky about having him uh, draw in that book? Because that was an amazing surprise. Yeah. I'm so happy that we got to keep that surprise uh, <laughs> under wraps because we didn't announce that before it went down. He wasn't even in, in the solicitation for the issue. I wanted... Um, you know, I used to be a comic book retailer. I used to like own a bunch of shops and stuff. So I'm always fighting to keep surprises in the pages of the books. Um, and there's some cool things coming. Um, I'll just say it. Uh, if you guys want uh, a big surprise within the pages of books, I would get my Thanos one shot that comes out in September. It's going to be a big surprise within the pages of that book. Um, those are things that I'm always fighting for because uh, I like readers to have a very singular experience and these are things that we can um those are ways that we can compete with things like netflix or films or tv shows that they can't do that we can do um that we can surprise people in the pages in comic book stores and give them like fun things um i'm going off on a tangent but yeah uh, Chip's a buddy of mine. Uh, I've loved his work for so long. And that's one of the coolest things about getting to Marvel is that you get to um, make friends with people that, you, that you've that you always liked, uh, that you've always really um, loved. And I had this gag, um, you know, Peter talks to a spider, um, that I wanted to do for my last issue. You know, it's actually funny how that came about was that my numbering on Strange my last issue is actually supposed to be my final issue of my uh, damnation event, mini event thing, right? But then um, I messed up. Um, uh, hey, Adam B. Chip is a, a total bro. I love his work too. Um, uh, uh, I messed up my own numbering and I ended up with one final issue that was just like by itself. And I didn't know what to do with that issue. Uh, and I went to Marvel and I was like, hey, I have this single issue by itself. Um, I have this idea that I want to do for my final issue. Um, can I just can I just do whatever I want for my final issue? And they were like, yeah, go for it. Just do whatever you, you want to do. Um, and so what I wanted to do was uh, essentially write an issue about Spider-Man because uh, he's my favorite character. And so I did that, and I, I wanted to do this Calvin and Hobbes kind of gag where Peter talks to an actual spider and um, um, make it really abysmal and dark because spiders are horrible. Uh, and so I called Chip because he's hilarious, um, and I actually wasn't calling him to ask him if he wanted to draw it. I was literally just calling him to be like, hey, man, is this funny? Like, are these, are these jokes okay? And while I was talking to him, uh, we kind of worked out some of the jokes. And he was like, hey, man, can I draw this? Like, I really want to draw this. And I was like, hell yeah, you can draw this, dude. And so I called Nick Lowe, who's our series editor. And I was like, hey, Chip wants to draw this. And Nick was like, well, that solves up my problem. I have to find someone to, to, to do it anyway. And so Chip banged it out, and we did it. Um, and we didn't tell anybody. Um, and it's one of my favorite things I've ever done at Marvel because it is so ridiculous and stupid and you know what um sometimes comics should be that you know um you know uh, uh i always i'm gonna go off on a mini a little mini tangent about art if you don't mind um you know uh it, it, there's 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 two kinds of art that are both equally important in my mind you know in in times of like you know very intense like you know like hardcore politics and like unrest and like when the world is very scary. Um, sometimes a book that is that like talks about those things and like addresses, um, you know, uh, a very serious and weighty emotions. It's very important and those things belong. Um, but also equally important, I believe, um, is providing an escape and providing something really, really fun for people to just go and kind of 
run away from the, the world for a while. Um, and that's what comic books always were for me. When I grew up, uh, I, 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 I tried to run away um, from the big scary world outside. And um, and that's what I've been trying to do with a lot of my Marvel work. It's not, it's not to say that it doesn't have you know important um, uh, uh, themes and uh, things that I want to talk about. Um, and Lord knows that Venom has a lot of that stuff in it, and Thanos does too. But sometimes... Uh, it's fun to talk to Peter talking to a spider about death, uh, and that's important too, I think. So, anyway, absolutely, absolutely. I can't disagree. It's trying to look up really quick uh, who the I thought it was Javier Rodriguez, but um, I know like I've seen uh, I've seen someone's art. I think it's a uh, Javier Rodriguez, and I I never really liked his art too much. And then all of a sudden, I saw Dennis Hopeless's uh, Volume Four and Volume Five of Spider Woman, and it was the same artist. And I didn't realize it when I was when I was watching it. And I just thought this is so amazing, like the the angles, the perspective, and all that stuff. If somebody's just looking on the surface, they're not going to see what I'm seeing. But that deeper, you know, look, it's where I, I come up with the idea always that art is very subjective. So yeah, I yeah, fully totally. agree that art is what it is. I know there are people who sometimes even on my uh, on my channel they'll they'll insult. I think there was like one person maybe who insulted the uh, the art in in Doctor Strange three ninety. I just I yeah. made those comments, you know. Yeah, no, dude, it happens all the time, and you know, I never take offense to that kind of that kind of stuff. I mean, <clears throat> different things are for different people. Lord knows, there's um, books and comics and stuff that I don't dig. It's fine, um, uh, you know, I. I, I will bristle sometimes if it's um, overly uh, antagonistic um, and meant to hurt. Um, you know, I don't mind people having their own opinions. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes going out of your way to tag someone so that they like they like you're like making sure they see it yeah. um, is rude, and I don't I don't really get why you would want to hurt someone like that, um, especially because. You know, I think people get wrapped up in the Marvel of it all, and the Disney of it all, and the DC of it all, and like they think of these things as, big, as these big moving machines and these companies. But everything is people. Everything that you read and touch and interact with is made by people. And none of us are ever trying to make bad art. None of us are ever trying to make bad comics. You know, and you know, we're all going to stumble sometimes, and we're all going to. You know, put out something that, that that you don't like, and that's absolutely fair, and you're entitled to those opinions. Um, and you know, um, if you if you don't like it, that's okay. That it just means that that one wasn't made for you. Um, and I'll catch you on the next one, right? Hopefully, I will. Ho hopefully, you'll come back. Um, but we're not ever doing it to hurt you. We're not ever doing it to make you mad or make you upset. Um, we're trying to do our jobs the best that we can. And sometimes the only time that I will bristle is when, um, you know, if I stumble upon a review that's not great, and that's fine. I, I, that's absolutely fine. Um, but when you go out of your way to make sure that we see that you don't like it or to make sure that you say something hurtful to us, just understand that we're just people. I mean, look, this is my place. This is where I live. This is my lunch. This is my hat. I'm a person just like you guys are. You know, I'm a comic book fan too. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I would I would always kind of take a second and, and take a breath and realize that you know we're not the enemy and we're just trying to make rad comics. You know, I couldn't have said it better myself without choking someone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things you just mentioned, uh, we're gonna actually just really quick, um, uh, Dick Fillmore. Wants to know um, how you got into comic or how you got into Marvel because else he keeps on getting these crazy cease and desist letters. <laughs> <laughs> um, how I got into Marvel specifically? Yes. Sure. Um, so it's kind of a winding story. I, um, um, I, hey, uh, everyone in the chat, before I go, just really quick before I answer this. Before I go, I'll, I'll do my absolute best to acknowledge all you guys and, and answer questions that you have. If I don't get to you, um, you know, follow me on Twitter and I'll try and get you there, but I'm not ignoring you, okay? Um, so how I got into Marvel, I was an intern in 2010, 
um, over there. I went to SCAD, which is the Savannah College of Art and Design, um, where I majored in sequential art. I was like, I was like um, uh, learning how to make comics, how to write comics, how to pencil comics, how to ink comics, all those kind of things. And I got an internship. I applied for and got an internship at Marvel. And, um, you know, I, I always kind of hesitate to tell that part of the story, to be completely honest, because I don't want to give the impression to anyone that my internship led to my getting a job as a writer. Um, that's not true at all. Um, you know, uh, obviously, uh, my internship made me, uh, got me in a position where they knew who I was, but they didn't hire me until 2017, you know, 2016. Um, and they only hired me when I started doing independent work and like, um, proving myself as a writer and as an, and as an, as an artist and as someone who can do this job. Right. Um, so yeah, so I was doing that right. And I was, and then books and blame all this. Yes, so I'm not. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, uh, trying to remember. So I, um, yeah, I just started making my own comics after my internship. I got a book, um, and I got a, a short story in Dark Horse Presents number 25 called Hunter Quaid. Um, it's about a time traveling alcoholic detective. It's not good. Um, and, I just kept on going. I just kept on making my own independent comics. But, you know, I'd be lying if I said that my goal wasn't always to do Marvel books. I grew up on Marvel. I, I love it. Um, but it wasn't until uh, God Country. God Country came out, and uh, it got Marvel's attention. And uh, Jordan White, who is actually was actually the editor that I interned for, uh, he read it. And, um, uh, <laughs> sorry, people keep on asking things that are interesting. God <laughs> country being optioned. What can I say to that? Anything yet? Um, I would say hashtag stay tuned. Um, <laughs> uh, God country got read by, uh, Jordan White, who then passed it on to Axel Alonso. And at the time they were, um, they were trying to find somebody to take over Thanos because Jeff Lemire was leaving and they called me and they asked me if I wanted to take over Thanos and as a huge Marvel Cosmic fan and as a huge fan of Jim Starlin I of course said hell yeah um, and so I took the weekend and I came up with the plot line for Thanos wins over about a weekend and I called Jordan White and told him what I wanted to, to, to do I started uh, that got approved. I started writing that, and then I think I had turned in one issue of Thanos Wins when they called me and offered me Doctor Strange, <laughs> to which I again said, hell yeah. Um, and again, by the way, Thanos Wins hadn't come out yet. Like, I had just turned in the script, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so they offered me Doctor Strange based on the strength of that first issue, and then I turned in my outline on Doctor Strange, and I wrote one issue of that, and then Axel Alonso called me and offered me an exclusive contract with Marvel. And it was one of the coolest days of my life. I, uh, I was in my apartment, um, and uh, Axel called me. It was so cool. Uh, it was raining outside, and uh, Axel called me, and he said, um, he said, I'm sorry if you can't hear me very well. I'm downstairs getting coffee. And I, and then he offered me, he was, he said, how would you like to, um, come and write Marvel comics exclusively for us? And it was, I started crying on the phone because I, I had always wanted, uh, to be an exclusive Marvel writer. I'd always dreamed of being in those Marvel retreats and all that kind of stuff. And the most important part of that was that when Axel said, I'm sorry if you can't hear me, I'm downstairs getting coffee. That coffee place that he was at, that's where I used to go and get everybody coffee as an intern. And the fact that he was calling me from that place to offer me an exclusive contract was, a, 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 I'd say a dream come true, but I, I, I couldn't have ever dreamed that big, right? Um, you know, that's a comic book one shot right there. <laughs> right? I know. It, it, sounds, it sounds fake. It's so cool, right? <laughs> 
Wow. No, that's great. That is great. Okay, so you brought it up. I didn't. Thanos. Look, <laughs> uh, I am one of those people who thinks that nobody can write uh, Thanos like Jim Starlin. But I agree. If anybody were to come anywhere even remotely close, man, you killed it with Thanos wins. I mean, maybe you saw my reviews where I'm just like jumping around and going, oh my God, is it possible for a comic book to be this good? Like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so how I came to find out about you. Um, oh, is I, I was I was in L.A. for a, a wedding and <clears throat> my wife was getting ready inside and I was just outside fucking around on my phone and someone on Twitter, uh, I forget who, somebody was just like, yo, you got to watch this dude's review because uh, this dude's so stoked. And I was outside and I pulled up your review and I was like, dude, this guy's great. Like, this guy is so stoked on Thanos. It's great, man. Um, You've been following me for that long? Did I just finally get something from you yesterday? <laughs> yeah, well, man, I check in on you every now and then. Um, and I, I got to say, I, you know, we kind of skipped over this part, but I wanted to thank you for having me on, man, because I um, I, I do love your channel and I love your, your reviews. It's so nice to see someone who is just so enthusiastic and is just so positive. Like, you put out the... You put out the same kind of energy that I try and put out in my books, and it's it's rad to see somebody kind of picking up on that on that on that vibe, you know. Thank you. Yeah, I, like I try to tell people, I read comics for me. I just review them for everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ghost Skittle. Um, Ghost Skittle says that he's. I think Ghost Skittle's fifteen, if I'm remembering correctly. I try to remember my my regulars. Um, the regulars who comment, at least. And mm -hmm. um, he says that his English teacher recommended Thanos Wins. Mm, that's a badass teacher. Because that's actually where I got the name professor from. I used to be a, a university professor over oh. in Saudi Arabia teaching uh, English as a second language. Actually, as a foreign language, I should say. Cool. So, <laughs> um, so that's awesome that like English teachers are reading your stuff. Uh, that's always where I got my best summer reading from. That's crazy. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there's too much to go over with uh, with Thanos wins. Let's talk um, about it. Say again. Let's talk about it. All right, dude. Um, crap! How the hell did you pull this off? Oh, real <laughs> quick, I've got this in here. First off, German um, German Pelta. I'm probably butchering the dude's name. I'm sorry, German. Herman. It's actually pronounced Herman. It's Herman Peralta. Oh, so G, this pronounces an H. You kind of love the English language, right? Yeah, right. We're so deficient that we just, let's just use this as this. <laughs> um, okay, and um, Rachel Rosenberg. Hey, man, is Rachel Rosenberg related to Matthew Rosenberg? No, okay, not Okay, there's at no all. relationship. No, okay, no. okay. No. Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, that, finally, that's like the biggest thing I had to clear up. It was great talking to you. I'm joking. <laughs> so, <laughs> Cosmic Ghost Rider. This is like a bats the dog. Could you have possibly known Cosmic Ghost Rider was going to be this over? Dude, no way. Oh, my God. Um, well, actually, let me really quick. Uh, Herman Peralta and Rachel Rosenberg was the creative team right before me. Oh. My, 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 the Thanos Wins creative team was uh, Jeff Shaw that I did um, uh, Thanos Wins with. Okay. Or that, I, that I did God Country with, sorry. And uh, Antonio Fabella. Uh, who did the colors on that? I apologize for screwing that up. Uh, no, no, I'm I was like me. literally looking up things in the last moment. So yeah, 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 yeah. Dude, it's all, it's all, it's all so much. Don't worry about it. Um, but no, dude, Cosmic Ghost Rider, dude. Oh my god. Oh my god, dude. Um, it, what a trip that whole thing has been. Um, I had him tattooed on me too. He's right here. Nice. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Yeah, that's my little homie there. <laughs> um. <laughs> So, you know, I... Uh, Thank you, JT Rex. Huh? Uh, JT Rex with a super chat. Donnie, huge fan. Dude, you're killing the game, bro. Professor, huge fan as you as well. Thank you. Also, I do want to thank everybody because, like, again, the, the sending sending writers and artists uh, my videos on, on Twitter or wherever you're sending them, that's awesome. I got to shake hands and, and all that uh, good stuff and actually hang out and have... Uh, exclusives with Jim Zub uh, because the exact same thing. People sending him my stuff, um, and Jim oh, Zub's that's great. Right. Huh? Uh, Zub's great. I went and saw uh, Infinity War with that dude in Canada. 
Oh really? Well, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. He's dope. And for crying out loud, like like Chip is up here also. I got to mm-hmm. shake hands with with Chip. He helped me bag my comic books. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chip is awesome, dude. So Chip Canadian is the best. Him. Like like um, I'm probably choke out anybody who who tried to you know say something bad about Chip. <laughs> no, Chip's, Chip's the best, dude. But yeah, next um, time you're up, man, freaking Gotham Central Comics and Collectibles. I guarantee, like Carlos and everybody, we'd love to have you up there signing autographs and everything. Of course, buddy. So, um, Cosmic Ghost Rider. Yeah, Cosmic Ghost Rider. So, yeah, dude. Uh, yeah, so Cosmic Ghost Rider was a character that I had wanted to do for a really long time. It's an idea that I had um, going back, like, pre-me being an intern. Um, it was just a funny idea, you know? It was, like, one of those jokes that I would tell people, like, boy, if I ever got to Marvel, do I have an idea in mind, you know? Um and it was, uh, you know, it, it came about because I was, I was just trying to think of like, um, you know, look, Ghost Rider is a character that started off just like Venom as just a rad drawing. Like, it's just a cool drawing that didn't really have like much more to it than people added on and like made it really cool, right? Um, and so I was, I was just thinking about like, what would make, what would make, um, a really rad drawing. I was like, okay, but that in space, like that'd be a really rad visual on the side of a van, right? Um, and then I started just thinking again, just playing around of just like, well, who would be a cool Ghost Rider in space? And I thought, well, Frank Castle would. I mean, because you know, who would be like really surprising? Well, who likes vengeance more than Frank Castle? Um, and so I started playing around with it, and then I got the Thanos job. And I, um, I needed this beat, you know, I had this beat in the first issue where someone comes from the future to the past to drag young Thanos to the future. And I was like, who could that character be? And could it be someone in the black order? Maybe someone like that. And I was like, no, wait, I have this character in my back pocket. I have this cosmic ghost Rider character. And so dude, to be perfectly honest, I put it in the pitch. I was just like, you know, I'm going to put this thing in the pitch and I'm sure it's going to get cut up and people are going to go like, what are you doing? What? No. And, uh, shockingly, um, Jordan white, my editor came back and was just like, dude, I love this. This is so cool. And it's telling, uh, of it's, it's, it's very telling of like how dark of a story Thanos wins in that Frank castle is the comedic relief. Right. Um, and I, I just started playing with him and I knew I needed somebody to kind of like break up the tension of two Thanos talking to each other, which if done incorrectly could just be monotonous and, and brooding and super heavy. Right. And so I needed these huge visual jumps and these huge, um, not huge, but like these like kind of, um, mood cutters with like Frank and with the Hulk and with all these things to kind of just break that up. Um, so he was born out of that. And then, you know, by virtue of the fact that he dies in the last issue, I think people can probably tell that none of us really foresaw him being this huge character that would go on to have his own series. Um, and so, um, it's, it's funny. I actually, I was getting this tattoo on my arm when CB Sabolsky called me and, uh, he called me. I was literally getting this inked on my arm, and I picked up. I answered the phone. Ian, who does a tomahawk, was tattooing this on me, and I answered the the phone. And I was like, I was like, "What's going on, CB?" And he was like, "Hey, man, I want to talk to you about Cosmic Ghost Rider." And I was like, "Well, shit. I hope it's good news <laughs> because I'm getting him tattooed on me." And he was like, well, hey, how would you like to write a solo series? Because he's, like, a really popular thing. And I was like, oh, my God, dude. So, like, I started to think about it. I was like, well, man, if I got this tattooed on me and I got a solo series, well, shit, I might as well just go ahead and get, like, Thor tattooed on and Spider-Man tattooed on so I can, like, get those (laughs) books, too. Um, And so, yeah, man, I got a solo series out of it. And uh, so far, so good. People are are digging that, too. Um, And there's really big plans for the writer after his solo series. A lot of people are asking um, why that mini series hasn't been turned into an ongoing considering how well it's sold and been received and everything. Mm-hmm. And the answer to that question will be revealed uh, very soon because uh, there's very definitive plans for where uh, Frank's going to end up next. Okay. 
Yeah. Right. That was, it was something I was like, should I ask this? Okay. Cool. I don't want to venture into spoiler <laughs> <laughs> territory. All right. Shoot. Okay, so earlier we were talking about um, people coming down hard on on uh, on writers and artists and whatnot. Oh, first, real quick, I want to mention. I think Ian, your artist, tattoo artist, must be the mutant ink. Tell me if I'm wrong. He must be the what? The mutant ink. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I mean, it, he's a lunatic. He's one of my best friends in the world. But he's a psycho. I love him. Uh, if he's if he's putting ink on you, and all of a sudden you're getting calls about that ink. That's something. Yeah, right? <laughs> All right. So uh, you did Damnation, Doctor Strange's Damnation uh, mini event uh-huh. with uh, Nick Spencer. Now, mm-hmm. I myself, I loved uh, Secret Empire. I got everything Secret Empire related. Uh, talked to some of the artists, one of the writers, and just, yeah, I, I love this stuff. I absolutely loved it. I think that the ending fell a little bit flat. Like, it was such a high-octane thing, it just felt a little flat. I'm like, okay, I can forgive it, but a lot of people came down really hard on Mr. Spencer. Dude sure. actually had to leave Twitter, which is sure. unacceptable. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, tells you a lot about the state of humanity and, and sure. the, the state of anonymity on the internet, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I believe... That damnation was the first thing that Nick Spencer, who's now doing an amazing, uh, well, literally amazing Spider-Man run that everybody's loving, it seems. Yeah. But I think that the first thing he did coming back was damnation with you. Am I wrong? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how was that working with him? Uh, dude, Nick's been a friend of mine forever, and actually has been mm-hmm. a big supporter of me. Um, in fact, uh, before. Um, before Thanos came out, a lot of people, a lot of people think that Thanos was my first Marvel work. Um, it in fact, was not. Um, my first Marvel work ever was during Secret Wars, the little, the little, like ten-page backup story in Secret Wars, Secret <laughs> Secret Wars Battle World number two. Um, that was my first thing, and it was horrible, and I didn't get invited back for a while. Um, but actually, before Thanos came out, um, you know, it's so funny. Uh, people forget about this, and they kind of gloss over it. And so people ask me about Nick all the time, and they will kind of weigh in on uh, his Captain America run. And what they don't realize is that I wrote some of that. Um, like, uh, my first Marvel work was uh, uh, Nick was handling uh, Secret Empire, and he was handling um, a lot of other books. And, man, having done it a little bit and uh, kind of wading into it a little bit now, um, handling a Marvel event is insane. Because uh, you're not just writing your book. You're, like, outlining everyone's stuff. Everyone is looking to you for answers. I mean, it's it's, it's a lot of work. And Nick um, needed help on Cap. And so I came in and I wrote three issues of Captain America for him. Which one? There were two, he was writing two Captain America books at the time. Yeah, I wrote two issues. I forget which one it is. I wrote two issues of Steve Rogers and one issue of Sam Wilson. Okay. Um, and I, it's like 18, 19, and then like 21 or something like that. I forget. Um, so I came on that and like, you know, that was, that was, you know, Nick could have gotten anyone to do that and he got me to do it um, because... A, he needed help. He knew I was fast and reliable, but also because he wanted to put me in a in a spot to get um, to get um, the right eyes and editorial to look at my stuff, um, and that led to them um, um, uh, uh, having faith in me to take over a bigger book like um, a bigger book like Strange, or then you know Venom, or these things, right? Um, and so you know, Nick's always been a buddy of mine, and. Last year at San Diego Comic Con, I left San Diego, got on a train, went to LA, and met with Nick, and we broke down this Doctor Strange event. Um, and you know, uh, it is a direct fallout of Secret Empire because Vegas was destroyed um, during the events of Secret Empire, and so it always felt right to have Nick in the room. And in fact, the beat of Strange resurrecting Vegas was a Nick Spencer idea. 
that was um, uh, a thing that he had pitched in the room, I think the retreat before I got there. Um, and so when I got to Strange, like right when I took over Strange, Nick and I were talking. He was like, this is the thing I want to do, and if you want to work on it together, that'd be really fun. And so, you know, we got into a room, and Nick and I um, beat out um, the book, and then he and I, uh, he was way more involved in, like, the first half of it, and then he uh, gave me the reins, uh, because by that point, he was like, he was actually working on Amazing Spider-Man a year ago, and um, he gave me the reins to it and just let me go, you know? Um, uh, Adam B. says, wish Nick would come back to Twitter so I could tell... Uh, so I or so I can yell about how much I love his Amazing Spider-Man. I will tell him. I promise. Nice. Um, and uh, and it's cool because you know, uh, but like I said, Nick's a buddy of mine, and now um, it's really fun because Nick and I get to be the brother and sister book of the Spider Office mm-hmm. together. You know, he's on Amazing. I write this guy here, um, <laughs> and so um, you know, since we've worked together in the past and we are buddies and we talk all the time, you know. Um, we get to um, the spider office is very happy because um, the the tie-ins between Amazing and Venom, if there ever are going to be any, um, are very easy to pull off because Nick and I are buddies. And Chip, who's writing a uh, Peter Parker spectacular? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's that's sick. That is sick. Okay. Okay. Really quick, I did want to say effing amazing job of giving Doctor Strange back his powers again. Very ingenious. Dude, what is it with you and black magic? (laughs) What is it with you and demons? (laughs) Oh, I just like the devil a lot, buddy. (laughs) You're running with him? Yeah, I just like, you know, metal and Pantera and, you know, I just, you know, I dig Satan, you know. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Do you mind me asking how old you are? I'm 33. 33, okay. Uh, I got a decade on you, exactly. And, uh, yeah, grown up in the 80s, forget about it, dude. That's exactly where everything was. I was there for the fall of metal. I still kind of resent Kurt Cobain a little bit. God rest his soul. Sure. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Guys like Cold Chamber, man, they, they kept me going until uh, we came back. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I in high school, uh, this, is a, this is an exclusive for you and your people here. Um, I was obsessed with like eighties hair metal and like, uh, oh shit that those of you, hi, I'm here. Um, I was obsessed with that, with this stuff. Joe Fisher says that Donnie Kate sell his soul to the devil. You got damn right. I did. Um, <laughs> On a and, uh, he can also play the guitar for that exact same reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a drummer. So I, 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 I shred in a different way. Brother, um, you and me, one of these days, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, so I was obsessed with, um, you know, metal and Pantera and Guns N' Roses, my favorite band of all time. And in high school, I was actually in a uh, Guns N' Roses tribute band called Appetite for Destruction, nice. in which I was Axl Rose. Uh, and so, uh, there exist pictures online somewhere, uh, of me dressed as Axl Rose and there exists one video, uh, somewhere of us playing live and me doing my little serpentine dance, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I go deep. That's a deep cut. I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. So let's just do it. Let's just talk about... This guy and its three predecessors right now. Venom. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah, you're on a seven-second delay. Sorry. No, I can't see what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you're seeing me like seven seconds later. So, dude, you and Stegman, also J.P. Mayer and uh, Frank Martin. Oh, my God. What are you guys yeah, doing to us? First man, off, first man. off, I need yeah. to know what's up with Ryan Stegman's obsession that it's better than Watchmen. <laughs> Oh, well, I don't know if you, you can call it. I don't know if you can call a true fact uh, an obsession. <laughs> okay, uh, you know what? I'm going to let that one slide because yeah, like this is amazing. Stegman is hysterical. Oh my god! <laughs> if you He's... guys aren't following Ryan Stegman on uh, on Twitter, you are missing out on way too much free comedy, man. Dude, he is hysterical. <laughs> like the whole. I was in a room. I was at the Marble Retreat. And Joe Casada was talking about how brilliant the marketing for Venom has been. 
and like how he was asking us, he was asking me how we orchestrated this whole Venom is better than Watchmen like media campaign. And I was like, what are you talking about, dude? I, it's just Ryan Stegman fucking around. Like it, this whole thing started with Ryan just being a dick and like it just exploded out of that. And like, like 90% of people get the joke that like we're obviously screwing around and that it's, you know, it's Venom. It's obviously not better than Watchmen. But like the best part of this whole thing are like the one percent of people who don't get it. <laughs> like who who for sure think that we are being so serious. Right? I'm uh, offended for, for Alan Moore. <laughs> Dude, oh my god, it's so funny. And like Joe, Joe Casada in the room was like, "How can we replicate this like viral marketing thing that's happening?" And I was like, "Dude, you can't. You can't ever replicate that ever again. Like this whole thing is out of control, and it's literally just Ryan being excited. I mean, that's the thing that I think that people are reacting to on this book." you know, rather consciously or unconsciously, um, I think that readers can always tell when a creative team is having a blast. And the the creative team that we have assembled on Venom, um, we are all just so dialed in. All these guys are 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 picking up exactly what I'm doing and like what 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 Ryan and I are trying to achieve. And like they're they're oh my god the entire comment section is just blowing up about how much better Venom is than Watchmen and look I you know what I'm with it man I'm so <laughs> about it um, uh, you know it, yeah yeah it really shows when the creative team wants to do their work is what Adam B says and that's exactly it man um, I remember I called Ryan and like Ryan and I have known each other for a while we run in the same circles as like friends and stuff in the in, in the industry we didn't really know each other that well. Um, and then when they, when they, um, when the spider office was like, how do you feel about Stegman on the book? I was like, well, let me call him because I want to make sure he's into the story. I mean, obviously his work is dope and I think his artwork is amazing, but let me just call him and see if we're vibing. Right. So I called him in and like what was supposed to be like a 20 minute phone call turned into like a four hour conversation. And we just became like immediate, like fast friends, you know? Um, and, 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 and he's as big of a Venom maniac as I am. And we just started like, and he's a good writer too. I mean, you can tell on his Twitter that like, he, he understands how to spin a joke. He understands how to fuck with people and like, you know, and that's writing, man. Like he can subvert your expectations in a tweet. Like he's good at what he does. He's not only as a very talented artist, um, visually, he's a great storyteller and he's a great actor. Um, and that combined with me and him getting along like crazy. And then you add in JP Mayer, who's just crushing it on his inks. And then Frank Martin's color palette, dude, get out of here. I mean, Frank could have, he could have absolutely made this book look like every other Venom book that's ever been made. But Frank Martin, just like me, just like Ryan, just like JP, Frank Martin is a fucking lunatic. <laughs> and came in and gave it this insane, like, Hellraiser vibe in the colors. And just, like, I mean, the printer has got to go back and, like, restock the red ink to fucking, like, to, like, to, like make this thing as demonic as it is. And, like, everyone just got on, on board right away with, we are going to make Venom the scariest the most metal book that's ever been made. And we're going to blow the fucking doors off of it. And it's Venom's 30th anniversary. We're the, we're, we're the biggest Venom fans on the planet. And the greatest gift of Venom as a writer is that the character is 30 years old, but there's so much left unturned. There is so much about the symbiote that's never been explored. There's so much about Eddie Brock that's never been, been explored. And all of a sudden, this kid who grew up reading Venom since I was three years old, I'm 33, he's 30 years old, and I've been there since the jump. All these questions that I've ever had about this, about this character, as it turns out, all the answers would come. I would just have to wait for me to be the writer of the book to answer them. And that's crazy. And like, it, it, it really was the perfect storm 
of everything because I had proven to Marvel by that point as a writer and as a creator that um, that I can do these wild stories that are so big um, while also playing by the rules as much as possible and not breaking these toys and like, and like spreading these like like, like um, spreading the the myth and expanding on the myth without burning everything to the ground right and so by the time I got to Venom I had done Thanos and Strange and um, the damnation event and so I got to Venom and they were like just go just do whatever you want let's let's blow the doors off it's his 30th anniversary it's a new number one and um, and this is the story that I've been wanting to tell since I was about nine years old and we're just getting started man the whole Null God of the Symbiotes thing is a, is a story that's going to have repercussions for years and years to come. And Ryan and I have this thing planned out for the next, like, 40 issues. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, man, we're just getting going. And, like, people, like, Ryan and I talk about all the, the, all the time. It's like, people read issue four, uh, which is a video of yours that I commented on to start talking about it. People read issue four and they're like, oh my God, dude, this shit's out of control. You legitimately haven't seen anything yet. Like we're, we're just getting, we're just getting started. All right. Well, to even talk about issue four, we got to know about your relationship with, uh, Jason Aaron. Yeah. Like what is this, this, this crazy love affair that you've got going on? Because this no one could have expected this, dude. There was no, there was not a single magic eight ball that fell on this by accident. Um, dude, um, I'm the world's biggest Jason Aaron fan. Um, Jason Aaron, in this man's opinion, is the greatest uh, writer currently writing comics. Um, as long as he's, um, uh. uh as long as he is writing comics, we're all fighting for a second place. Um, and and I've been following his work since God since since he started um, from Scout uh, to his first appearance in Marvel when he won the talent contest. Um, his little his Wolverine issue from the other side to Scout to I mean God everything. I, mean, I, I I just I'm in awe of him and. When uh, one of the coolest things about um, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the coolest things about getting to Marvel and being an exclusive writer, um, to me personally, is getting to befriend my heroes, and uh, I'm I am I'm honored today to be able to call Jason a friend. Um, and to be able to call him and text him and get his feedback on cool stories and stuff, you know? Um, I mean, that's, that's a dream come true for me. Um, and so um, when I started putting together my Venom pitch, I mean, as you can see in Venom number four, I'm tying together everything. You know, I mean, there's, there's, there's not much I'm not pulling from and, like, trying to make sense of this very con polluted is maybe a bad word for it, but just uh, deep and intense like layers of stories about the symbiotes. And I'm trying to acknowledge all of it without negating any of it, you know? Um, and and so to that end, there's certain things that lined up perfectly um, with Jason's Thor run, um, which I believe is a modern masterpiece. I think when all is said and done, when Jason's Thor run is over, we will be talking about how fortunate we are as readers to have lived on this earth as that run was coming out. You will have Walt Simonson's run and you will have Jason Aaron's run as the greatest Thor stories of all time. And boy, oh boy, did that sword that Gore uh, held look a lot like a symbiote. Um, and I was reading that run as it was coming out and it was, um, it was one of those things that I was just a fan when that was coming out. That that came out in 2016. Is that right? No, that's not right. Like no, 2013. Was, was it 2016? No, it had to have been earlier than that. I know I was I was over in the Middle East when that came out. So I never actually owned any of those until I came back here. And it's funny, I just looked up. I, I just want you to know what you did to us. Well, you <laughs> could have given us a hint. 
I I check out a bunch of online auctions for comics. Oh, and God. the price of that went from two dollars that issue number six of Thor up to sixty dollars as a starting bid. Sixty dollars? Sixty US, dude. You, oh my god. You're killing I know us. it's so confusing. Everyone keeps on asking me, so like, wait, what is Null's first appearance? Um I don't know, man. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't I don't I don't know what to tell you. Um I know that like the collector's side of, of, of comics is like a big deal and everything. Um and as a retailer, like I get it, man, but like I'm just trying to tell good stories. Um I don't really know what to tell you. I guess canonically they both are. Uh, you know, one was his first, you know, appearance unnamed, and then Venom number, what is it, number three is his first named appearance, like first full appearance. I don't know. The first um, cameo. Yeah, cameo appearance and then named appearance. Because, like, you know, Venom's first appearance is the same thing, you yes. know. Um, he had a cameo appearance when he pushed Peter in the tracks and then his full first appearance. So think of it like that, I guess. Um but yeah, so Jason's run on um, Thor is just incredible. I mean, it's it, it's still going on. It's still incredible, and I know things that you guys don't. And it's gonna even it's it's just gonna keep on getting more incredible. Um, and so yeah, when I was tying all these things together, it just made sense to me that um, you know I wanted Null to be the god of the void. Um, there's there's themes there. Um, you know, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but Eddie's not doing great. Um, Eddie's suffering in a big way. Um, he's when I was kind of building my Bible for Venom, I I, I, I tried to really explore the, the psychology of who Eddie Brock is as a character. And what I what I what I landed on was that Eddie Brock is made maybe the most codependent human being on Earth. And how did he get that way? How did he become uh, that kind of a dude? And so everything that I've done to build out his backstory is kind of built from that. And so to that end, Eddie's biggest fear in life is being alone and being in the darkness and not having anybody. And so what you have then thematically is a character like Null, whose entire journey in life and his entire quest as a god is to be alone. All he wants is to get rid of the, the, of the light and, of, and he, he wants to get rid of humanity. He wants to return to his void. And the thing that scares Eddie Brock more than anything in the entire world is being in that void and being alone. Um, and so you 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 put those two against each other and make some really some really interesting uh, uh, stuff to build on. Um, and so you know everything starts off small. You know everything starts off like that and then builds out uh, into these big epic things. Um, and so yeah, uh, I don't really know. I, you know, I called Jason and I was like, "Hey, man, I got some wild shit I want to run by you." I was like, "Did you ever have an origin for the for 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 All Black for the for the sword?" And he was like, "Not really, man. Like, I had you know like bits and pieces that I put in Thor of like what it is and everything, but not really like past that." And so I pitched him Null and like creating it from the from a shadow and creating it from the void itself and everything like that. And what's rad about Jason, man, is that, like, Jason and I have a really similar aesthetic as storytellers. We're excited by the same kind of story, which is not surprising since I'm a huge fan of his work. It's not surprising that he would be, it'd be vice versa, that he would dig my ideas, I guess, you know? Um, and so, it's just so fun talking to him because everyone thinks of him as, like, this, uh, this big, scary... You know, Jason Aaron, he's a legend, he's an architect, you know, but he's just a nerd like me. He gets excited about this stuff too. And so I was like laying all this stuff out for him and he was like, oh man, that's cool. It's really fucking cool. Like, let's do that. Like, like let's play off that and I'll play off this and I'll do this. And so uh, Jason and I touch each other's stories maybe more than, than I do with uh, a lot of other writers. Um, and you saw that in Venom number two when I talk about the Celestials falling out of the sky. Um, and then obviously in issue three, and then if people will start paying attention to what Jason's doing, um, things that I do will start being touched upon in his stuff. And even in, um, we've been doing that for a while though. Like even when, you know, obviously I took over Dr. Strange, uh, from Jason ostensibly. And, um, I was touching upon a bunch of shit that he did in that. And then when he came, um, 
and when when uh, in in Thor, Doctor Strange showed up in that and like made fun of the whole veterinarian thing. And uh, yeah, if you go back and look, like Jason and I have been talking to each other in comics for a while now, and we're going to continue to do so. Oh man, it's that's great. Okay, so I I didn't um, I read the the previous Thor issue and I didn't understand it, and I don't like to review comics that I don't understand because I feel like I'm going to come down too hard on them. Mm-hmm. So damn it, fine. I'm going to go back and I'm going to read it because if you're saying that it all combines. And I have come to just trust that Jason Aaron's going to do amazing stuff. I mean, like what he's doing with Ghost Rider, especially in, uh, in the Avengers, is absurd. Like, oh my god, it's incredible. So dope. Yeah, that's, that's one word for it. <laughs> so dope. Um, I love what you're doing with the psychology of Brock. My two hobbies in life are psychology and comics, believe it or not. Um, so, yeah, just you explaining that and, and then making that, that diaspora there where... You know, Null wants to just be alone, and Brock uh, fears the most being alone. That is such a great juxtaposition for them to be in. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I love that. Um, are we going to find out more about those two gods that were fighting? One of them actually held all black. Uh, From Jason Aaron's in, run, sorry. In the two gods that were fighting? Yes. They, they killed each other when uh, Gorb came along and, and took all black. He found it. Well, the black one was Null. That was actually Null himself. Okay, that's what I figured. Yeah, uh, yeah. if you watch in the in the previous page, Ryan Stegman draws Null fighting um, all these golden gods that are armored, and he's killing these gods. And as he fights, he's getting stabbed. And he's getting stabbed, and so he creates armor around him. And the last piece of armor that he makes is the helmet that you see. And then they fall together, and they're in that pit. And then Gore comes, steals the sword from from Null, leaves, and then uh, Null rises out of the pit. Mm. So, are we going to find out who that golden god is that he's fighting? Uh, not in my run. Gotcha. Uh, he's just he's just some he's just some loser, dude. <laughs> you know, is that Celestial's head actually nowhere? Yes. Okay, I saw you mention that on Twitter a couple days ago. I'm mm-hmm. like, crap, was I wrong? Really? <laughs> yeah, it's nowhere. That's amazing. So, Guardians of the Galaxy, guys, uh, nowhere. Amazing stuff. Um, okay, yeah, shoot. That's from what you were just uh, going on. That's that's exactly what I had. So, yeah, uh, there's an old Chinese adage, uh, an idiom. It says the, the poison is in the compliment. So, I don't want to over-compliment you. I don't want to pepper you <laughs> too much with them, but... Dude, literally, like a lot of people are saying in the chat, everything that you're doing right now is freaking gold. So, oh, thank you. No, 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 no. You don't get to do that. Thank you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so. Well, I just, that means so much to me, guys. I mean, I, I you Sean, know, I, ask your question, dude. What's up? Sean, I'm telling Sean Sadry to uh, ask his question about the death of the humans. Oh, yeah, let's, yeah, I know. I, I yeah, don't be scared of asking stuff. And, and and uh, and Bill, if there's people in the chat that you see that have that have um, dope questions and stuff, let's get to that because I got to go in here into just a little bit. Uh, and I want to make sure that I'm not ignoring you guys. Uh, yeah. What uh, uh, one question was? What cereal are you eating? What cereal am I oh, eating? What, what are you eating? They said. Oh, I'm eating a salad. Oh, a salad. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Donnie does some crazy awesome stuff. Any chance you get a nerd favor and bring Flash back to life? Oh, oh Flash, Flash Thompson. Thompson? Um, no. Done. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Will Luna and Ahura be in the Death of Inhumans? Uh, Keep reading. Yeah, Donnie told me, like, he's not going to give a whole lot about this, uh, about the Death of Inhumans to you guys. There's a lot coming in there. But one thing that he did say was... That the title's not cute. (laughs) Uh... Can we get Mr. Cates on Spider-Man soon? That would be super dope. Who owns Who owns the Hotel Inferno now? Um, that's a good question, right? Um, I uh, I revisit that soon. Um, I'm not going to tell you in what book I'm doing it in, but there's we're going to get back to Vegas uh, here in a little bit and uh, check in on what uh, our old boy Dev the the Devil is doing. 
Okay. Do you have anything coming up with Mr. Peter David? Do I have anything coming up with Peter David? Yeah. I don't even really understand the question. Uh, Peter David is writing um, uh, Ben Riley. The oh, uh, do I? Oh, the question is is like is Venom gonna like cross over with Scarlet Spider? That's my question. Yeah. I see. Um, no comment. Done. Okay. I like that. Um, is Vox and Null related? From Garrett uh, Rankson. Um, Rankin. Keep reading Death of the Inhumans. Oh, damn. All right. Holy crap. Good question, Garrett. Um, would Maximus and Loki have an evil child? <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> what? What's the question? Would Maximus and Loki have an evil child? Well, yeah. I mean, Maximus and Loki are the same character of two different families, right? Yeah. Um, I will say that my friend Megan uh, would maybe be the biggest fan of watching those two characters have that child. <laughs> uh, Loki can uh, change sex, even back in the mythology. So he can. That's a true story. Um, read the one with uh, Loki. Uh, excuse me, Thor, Loki, and the giant building the wall with the uh, the horse, the stallion guys. Uh, Sue Ann, the death of the humans is meant to break our hearts. I know this. Uh. Is it meant to break your heart? Is it indeed? Uh, I mean, it, I, I killed a dog in the first issue, so <laughs> you tell me. It's not meant to make you feel good. I'll say that. Oh, man. So we don't ever want you to write Peanuts comics. No, you don't want that. And that's the thing. It's like all these people saying like, oh, I want you to write Spider-Man. Oh, I want a bunch you to write this and this and that. Just be careful what you wish for, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes the cold blade of death. So be, 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 be careful. <laughs> oh, man. Um, got a whole bunch of, hey, what's up? Uh, what's going on? Your friend Megan. <laughs> Your friend Megan is like, damn right. Yeah. Um, what was the inspiration behind Vox? Be, be, behind Vox? Um, <clears throat> well, um, uh, speaking of cold blades of death, um, I, you know, anyone who reads my work uh, at Marvel knows that I'm a big fan of additive storytelling. I, I don't like telling stories about stories. Um, I read too many comics that are just retellings of old stories um, that, like, the comic book writer is clearly a fan of, like, this old Batman story. And so it's just going to retell this story about this dude fighting Joker again. And, you know, I mean, that's fun, right? But I... You know, all my favorite comics introduce a new element, add to the add to the library. You know, they 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 introduce new things that maybe will stay around or maybe won't. Um, and so, the thing about a new character is that all of a sudden you're in. Would I ever write Hell Blazer? Someone just read uh, Ian. This dude just asked me if I would ever write Constantine. You're goddamn right I would. And I would write the shit out of that book. I have a Constantine pitch ready to go in my back pocket that would fucking blow your dick off. Anyway. Um, Sorry, dude. Uh, it's that exclusive Marvel contract, man. Yeah, I know. Uh, someday. Um, no, I mean, the thing is, what's cool about a new character and about a new villain is all of a sudden, you're, you as the reader, you are out of your comfort zone. Right? Because, look, when the scorpion shows up in Spider-Man, yeah, you know, you kind of get how a scorpion story is going to go, or a Sandman story. Like, you know, Spider-Man's probably not going to kill him. Scorpion's probably not the guy who's going to kill Peter, right? But, like, think, of, think back to JMS's Spider-Man and run. How about when Moreland showed up? When Moreland showed up, all of a sudden, you didn't know what was going to go down. You didn't know who this dude was, what he was capable of. All of a sudden, the stakes are raised up like crazy because you're in a place where you've never been and in, in, a, in an environment that you've never been and that Peter's never been, right? That shit is interesting. And so when you're fighting a character like Null or, or like Vox, all of a sudden, the game changes, right? And so I, I like doing stuff like that. I like making the reader feel like they have no idea what is coming next and that anything is possible. And so I wanted to design this character um, that immediately makes you think that everyone is in trouble. And uh, when I was designing Vox, um, 
I I just steal shit from anime all the time because man, anime's got. I don't even really watch anime or I don't, I don't even really read manga, but those guys have got uh, blades figured out. Those guys have got it locked down. And so if you ever need, need a like a, like a cool sword or a rad scythe, look no further. And so I know I needed. I needed Vox to have a scythe. I wanted him to have like an energy scythe. And then for his for his actual look, I kept on saying, like, I really like the Earth X design um, of Black Bolt that Alex Ross did, right? And uh, you know, design started coming in and I was like, yo, I I you know, I again I kinda like that Earth X design. And then Will Moss, um, um, my um, my my editor on it eventually was like, yo, why don't we just ask Alex Ross if we can just use it? And then I was like, oh, right, this is Marvel. You can just do that. Um, and so we did. We just Alex, we, we, we asked Alex Ross if we could use the EarthX to design for Black Bolt. And he was like, yeah. Um, it helps that Alex Ross is a Texan, as I am too, so we are contractually bound to protect each other. Um, <laughs> And so the design, here's the thing, you'll notice I'm avoiding your question um, and talking about what he looks like and not the inspiration behind why he's there, uh, because only a single issue is out and I can't tell you anything. Done. Done. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Okay, Mark Anthony Martinez asks a good question. Will we, will we see Sidorak in the Cosmic Ghost Rider since his chains are made of his bones? Um, man... You guys are asking good questions, <laughs> really good questions. Um, I have, um, hmm, hmm. I just re-signed with Marvel in my exclusive contract for four more years, oh. and I have Sidorak plans. Um, I don't know that they'll specifically be in Ghost Rider, um, but I have plans, and the fact that his chains are forged from the ground bones of that entity um, uh, is, was something I did not do lightly. I'll say that. All right. Uh, Cyber2G, that question was answered much earlier. Um, the Cosmic Ghost Rider uh, going, uh, ongoing. Um, yeah, when you said about Morlun, that was a very interesting point because... I was reading Black Panther at the time when he killed Manape and he killed Shuri. Like that right there was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Everything's literally off the table. These are fairly major characters here. Yeah, dude. So <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Like that's the stuff that really shakes things up. Uh, okay. Uh, I think that's pretty much everything. What What else is, uh, you guys been praying? Last questions, guys. I gotta get the hell out of here. Yeah. Yeah, I actually only had him slayed for 15 minutes. <laughs> so, How long have we been going? Uh, an hour and 23 minutes. Yeah, see, that's the thing. People, when they call me to interview me, they're always like, we'll just be like 10, like 10, 15, and I'm like, no, you won't, because it's me, and I talk forever. I could not have known that. I genuinely meant to keep this with just Venom. <laughs> no, no, no. This is my fault. I love talking I about this shit. Because when I said, I was like, do you have like uh, 15 minutes? Yeah. Because uh, like I was in the army. So me and time management, man, we're like, we're like <laughs> that, you know? So uh, when you said, oh, let's just talk and see what happens. We're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, what are my thoughts on the Venom movie? Um mm -hmm. I tell you what, man. I've seen a lot of people um, throwing around, you know, uh, uh, um, criticisms and things like that. I tell you what, man. Why don't we just uh, Why don't we just all take a breath, relax, and be thankful that we are all alive at a time that they are making a goddamn Venom movie? Holy shit! Like, how cool is that? You know, and at the end of the day, it's gonna have Venom in it. And that's pretty fucking rad. Um, you know, Tom Hardy's not in the business of making bad films. He is, he, I mean, he made one bad film that was a Star Trek film. And I don't think that was his fault. Um, so I have a lot of faith in it. Um, that being said, I am going to the premiere. Um, so, uh, you know, take everything I'm saying with, with a huge grain of salt since I uh, kind of have to say all this. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> Michelle Williams is going to be in it also. She's an amazing yeah. actress, and there's a chance for She Venom to be in it. Therefore, sure. Um, I have two. I have no more questions. Be thankful. X Men is getting dis. Yeah, that's right. How do you feel about X Men and um, uh, Fantastic Four coming home? Um, I'm real excited. Um, I am uh, not legally allowed to say much more. Done. I think I understand. All right, cool. All right, then, uh, guys, um, <laughs> thank you. All right, yeah, seriously, uh, Mr. Cates, I genuinely appreciate you showing up, and uh, that was unexpected and freaking awesome. This totally changed everything I was planning on doing for my podcast today. So, um, Cool, man. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me, dude, honestly, and keep doing what you're doing, and, uh, you know, you're you're a force for good out here, dude, and uh, I know a lot of us um, and, um, and a lot of fans out there really appreciate it, and uh, thank you so much for covering all, all of my work, man, and I, I, and to everyone who's watching at home and commenting and everything, thank you guys so much, and I hope I won't uh, I don't know. I'll do my best to not fuck all this up. <laughs> <laughs> Just one day. Have, have a worst yeah. day ever, right? <laughs> anyway, guys, thanks so much for showing up. Again, the podcast is very little without you guys. It's just two guys talking otherwise. So, Professor Bill and Donnie Cates, uh, Comic Book University, class dismissed.